Hello and welcome to the latest installment of the Spirit of Fire blog tour and today I have the honor of being at the Redheaded Bookworm and being hosted by Heather and thank you Heather for having me and uh, thank you to all the audience uh, of Heather's blog uh, for taking a look at this today uh, but I'd like to uh, read a short bit from Spirit of Fire for you my third book in the Fires and Eden series and also, um, I will address some questions that Heather has given to me in advance uh, to answer here on the video. So, uh, first question she asked is, do I have any hidden talents? Uh, well, um, as of now, it's kind of hidden. It wasn't so hidden earlier, but I actually used to be a pretty avid guitar player. Um, I really would like to get back into it uh, full-time, but I started on classical guitar, and then I moved into, you know, playing electric guitar, and of course, with my love of hard rock and heavy metal, I, uh, you know, played quite a bit of that, so I'm hoping I get a little time and space to be able to dive back into that, but that's probably something a lot of the people in the book world probably don't know about me, is that I actually did uh, quite a bit of guitar playing, so so we'll, 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 we'll vote for that one as far as the hidden talents, so um, cat or dog, both, um, grew up with basset hounds, and uh, had the great, was considered myself a 100% dog person, but was completely won over by two wonderful rescue cats, uh, one named Chewy and one named Harold. And Harold is actually the basis for the Harvey character in my Harvey and Solomon steampunk stories that are in the Dreams of Steam 1 and 2 anthologies. So, uh, so I, I definitely have come to, uh, full, you know, to, to a full swing to love cats as much as I do dogs. So I, I have to say, as of now, both. It would have been different if you'd asked me that about 10 years ago. But um, how long have you been writing? I've been writing, um, writing probably dabbling, I'd say dabbling in high school but then getting more serious about it as I entered my college years. And so, uh, so since about the, you know, the mid nineties, um, I've been very, very serious about it. So that gives you a little bit of the idea in terms of the span that I've been, that I've been doing this. So, um, if I could visit any place, where would it be right now? Top of my list is Germany. And, uh, and that's just because I've always wanted to visit Germany uh, in terms of part, it's a half of my heritage. And uh, I have gotten to visit uh, another big chunk of my heritage when I uh, went a couple of years ago to Ireland. Uh, and but now, but that Germany still remains, and so that would be the top place on my list to explore. And of course, all the the centuries and centuries and centuries of great legends and myths, and you know, and King Under the Mountain, with you know, and it's all the great things that come out of Ger Germanic lore, and uh, in the you know, all the great stuff of medieval history in the Germanic regions. I mean, I, just a place that I really would like to see and uh, and explore. So. Uh, so that would be it, and I know uh, uh, Michael Bellow uh, from Edie's Book Lighthouse. Uh, I'm definitely going to have a beer with him when I finally get there. So, but if I could uh, uh, see favorite food, um, I have to say, uh, man can survive on pizza alone. I love pizza, and uh, it's definitely what I call the most complete food because if you can make you make your pizza right, you can have every food group represented. So so it's actually uh, a food that along with water you probably could survive on. So I, I will claim pizza. And my favorite style being the New York style of pizza. Just absolutely love that. So so I'm I'm pretty cheap in my taste then. <laughs> okay, what jobs did you have before you became a writer? Um I've done a lot of odd odds and ends throughout the years. I've even you know, spent some time working in a, in a cancer research lab. I've done internships at TV news stations. I've uh, worked in a fitness uh, gym uh, health club kind of environment. I pursued doing indie record labels and doing, you know, kind of booking management stuff with indie, indie bands. Uh, I've done a lot of different things, and all, all of it has been good for me as a writer because it's given me a kind of a broad spectrum of things to, to draw off on. And so, uh, so I, you know, having that variety in, of experience has, has been a good thing. What is one book you could read over and over? And I'd have to say definitely the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And every time I read it, I get something new out of it. It's that thickly layered and there's that much depth that Tolkien wove into it. That it is the kind of book that you can get something new out of with about every reading. And so... Uh, so that's one I could read probably, you know, once a year if I, if I had all the time in the world. But um, what do I do in my free time? Um, I love to, I love movies, and uh, I love 
I love music and I love to, you know, when I do have, you know, the ability to, I like to go to concerts and things like that. And I love to, you know, I love to hang out with friends. I'm very, very much a, a very casual sort of person. I don't need to have anything too fancy to have a good time. And so, you know, just some simple things like that. And, uh, you know, or even going, you know, out, out to a farm and shooting, or, you know, shooting guns or something fun, something fun like that even, you know, just to do something different. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of different things that I can get into. And so, uh, so yeah, it's a, a little bit of a variety. But lately, I, uh, free time is, you know, I almost say, like, what's that? You know, lately I have not had a whole, whole lot of it, but we hope to, hope to get a little bit more in the future. Um, how do reviews, good or bad, affect you? Um, I think, well, um, good reviews, you certainly don't mind when somebody likes your work. And bad reviews, I mean, you're going to get them. I don't care who you are. I mean, you look up any author on Amazon.com, uh, New York Times bestseller, and, and, they, and they all have bad reviews. I mean, it's something that just goes with the territory. And for me... Um, it's two things. I mean, if they if if they just kind of you know just trash the book, it's something that I really you know I don't get anything you know that's something I just kind of brush off. But if it's something where where they have a constructive criticism where they go into a, a detail about you know what they you know what tripped them up about the book or what they didn't like about the book, I mean I think those are helpful sometimes. Uh, you know, in terms of you know, and I and I appreciate those kind of uh, you know those kind of bad reviews are definitely more appreciated than one that just slams it. You know, you know, you know, sometimes using name calling or something like that. And so, but I use you know bad reviews certainly. I mean, it like just like rejection letters. I mean, you use them for motivation, and uh, you know, and I think they're you know they can help help you cha if you can channel it right. You can use it to really help motivate you. So, so it can be a motivator. Um, when writing, do you plot and organize, or do you write then fit it all together? Um, doing the kind of series that I do, I do uh, have to have some outlining uh, because other, I need to know the direction that I'm going in and the basic uh, structure of what I'm, you know, doing within each installment of a series. And so there is uh, a definite uh, basic structure in place. But I do leave uh, openings. Uh, so if there's new characters that I want to explore that jump out at me that demand to be uh, come to the surface, I mean I have room for that. So for subplots to develop, for other story threads, I mean I do leave room, you know, in those in in those kind of areas. So so I'm kind of a half and half, you know, half plotting and, and organizing, and then half uh, kind of leaving it open for when when I'm once I'm into it. But you really, I mean, with any kind of book series of this scope, I mean, you have to know your destination that you're going toward. Otherwise, you can get off track really easily. What is the one thing you absolutely cannot do without while writing? Um, I, I'm a bit of a creature of habit. I mean, I have a computer that is not hooked up to the internet that is solely for my writing and I play music when I write and, and to this point the music kind of forms a backdrop uh, that kind of walls off the outside world and you know noises from outside and things like that I live in a suburb so that, you know obviously there's some out, outdoor noises and stuff and the music kind of helps form that bubble and so uh, so I, I kind of need that uh, kind of wall between me and the outside world so I do kind of like to say that, that for me, I mean, having some music playing is definitely something that helps me uh, kind of get in, you know, d definitely with the specific type of work setting that I have, it helps me get into my groove a lot faster. Uh, tell us why we should read your book. Well, if you like epic adventures and if you like, uh, you know, a, a very nice diverse cast of characters, I mean, I think those are two good reasons. Uh, to read my book. The other thing is, is that it's very original. I, I definitely um, am not. A, I can say with, with with surety that I'm not a clone of anybody else out there. Uh, it's definitely got its fresh aspects, and I'm also in the kind of writer that balances between the iconic and fantasy, and then new and inventive things. I mean, there are, you know, there are things like a dragon race and wizard races in my in my series, but at the same time, I have. Cultures like the Trogans and the Ungahur and the and you know the flying Daroks you know that uh, that that make a very prominent appearance in Crown of Vengeance and so I have things that are you know very inventive and then and not commonly seen like I have a culture that's based on the Iroquois uh, that's encountered from the get go in Crown of Vengeance and uh, then I have the things that are you know more commonly seen 
you know, like a culture based on the Vikings and so forth. So I think I have a nice balance of those two kind of spheres, and I think that's another selling point, I think, of, of my series, is that, you know, you, around every turn, I mean, you'll find some things that are comfortable and familiar, and also, uh, you'll also find some things that are going to be new that are going to be thrown at you, so so I think it's a lot, of, a lot of fun, it's something you can immerse into, it's also the type of series that you can read on different levels, you can definitely uh, make what you want to out of it. Uh, read it for pure entertainment, dig a little deeper and, you know, get at some of the themes that it's that are working through it. I mean, there's a lot to work with in this series, and I think uh, I think people, you know, start digging under the surface. I think they'll find a very rich, epic fantasy series to, uh, to enjoy. Uh, what are you currently working on? Uh, currently working on the fourth book of the Rising Dawn Saga, because I write them in kind of an alternating fashion, where I do, uh, you know, the fourth book of Fires and Eden I'll do after I finish the fourth Rising Dawn Saga book, and so I'm working on that, and then some short stories, working on some steampunk with Harvey and Solomon, I'm also working on some horror short stories, and then some more short stories from my Chronicles of Ave and Annals of the Rising Dawn ebook collections. Okay, anything I'd like to add? Well, um, just uh, I'd like to add, just I'd like to invite readers just to try me, you know, just try out my, my stuff. I think there there's some, there's char there's bound to be a, some characters you like because I write in an ensemble style. Um, I definitely you know have you know some of the big stuff like you know epic battles and so forth. But I also view it through the eyes of you know characters and the characters are what drives it. This ensemble of characters and so I definitely like to invite the readers out there to try my work. And uh, so thank you very much. And in just a second, I'm going to do a reading from Spirit of Fire. And now we're going to do a little reading from Spirit of Fire, and I thought it'd be fun to let you get to know a little bit about with a couple of the characters from our world that in Crown of Vengeance, the first book, get taken back into Ave. At this point um, in the story, they I don't want to give away too many major spoilers, but they have been taken captive by forces loyal to the Unifier, and they're on a ship. Uh, so this is, this is the setting they're at. Um, and they and Janice and Eric and all them are you know from from our world. The immediate surroundings were beyond meager. One rickety wooden chest and a pair of hard cots in the timber decking comprised most of their accommodations, with the exception of a circular metal bowl sitting on the floorboard in the corner to Janice's right. It did not take much imagination to realize the bowl was intended for bodily waste. In the dimness of the hole, Janice felt it would be quite an achievement to even utilize it. Janice flinched slightly feeling a hand settle down gently upon its tense shoulder. Looking about in the scant ambience afforded by the light trickling through the edges of the opening to the main deck, he could tell that Erica was sitting beside him. She gave him a reassuring smile, with no hint of fear or worry present in her face. You stay strong, Erica said in a low voice. You need to follow your own advice, the advice you gave to Antonio. I couldn't offer you anything better than that, so listen to yourself. It is sometimes easier to see from without than from within, Janice muttered staring at the wooden planks underneath. I'm not feeling very strong right now, and I still don't know what to make of all this. He listened to the creaking of the wood, feeling an unsettling lightness within his belly as the ship was lifted and then brought down heavily by the ocean's rolling surface. The first tickles of a clammy chill brushed his skin, and he could only hope that motion sickness did not envelop him. Who knows what to make of anything right now, Erica responded after a few moments. You've seen what's happened. They're keeping us for an important reason. They aren't going to kill us, not a chance. That I'm sure of. At least not right away, Janice replied disparagingly. How long until they figure out we're not that valuable? Erica grinned, shaking her head light slightly. Well, I consider myself valuable by any standard. And there's the fact we did come from another world, no denying that. And let's make sure they don't forget that either. We may truly be valuable to them, even if they don't know exactly how. Use your head, this thing here on your shoulders. Playfully, she laughed, lifting her right arm and tapping lightly on Janice's head with her knuckles, as if knocking softly upon a door. The gesture pulled a grin through Janice's morose countenance. The sounds of bolts being retracted filled the room. The movement sounded loudly within the still hole, jarring the occupants from their subdued states. The farther trap door to the upper deck swung slowly upward, allowing copious amounts of light to flood the lower hold. The light revealed the massive form of an armored, helmeted knight. The big warrior momentarily blocked the incoming sunlight, stepping slowly down the short flight of steps to the lower decking. Janice could not read the man's expression encased within the full helm, 
but he doubted it held anything friendly. The silhouetted knight worked his way methodically towards the captives. Hunched over within the cramped conditions, the enormous guard finally entered their area of the long hold. Two others like him followed after descending the, shor after descending the short staircase. When the three had drawn near to the captives, they occupied most of the available space. Without a word, the guards trailing the giant strode forth and sent about binding the wrists of the four prisoners. Unceremoniously, they assisted the captives to their feet. Come along now and give me no trouble, the large warrior grunted when the four prisoners were on their feet. With his large hands, he grabbed Logan roughly at the shoulder and yanked him forward. Lay off him, Antonio said angrily. You must feel pretty tough with all that armor on. Janice froze in disbelief at Antonio's sheer recklessness, and the next moment he could see that Antonio's brain was quickly catching up to his impulses, but his mind had not been fast enough. The damage could not be undone, and the young man's eyes were widening in fear and panic. The knight stopped and whirled toward Antonio. Janice could feel the hot wave of indignant ire pouring from within the darkness of the helmet's eye slits. The knight tromped over and threw a heavy, unforgiving punch with his mail-covered fists straight into Antonio's unobstructed gut. Antonio buckled over, falling to the floor timbers like a dead weight, gagging and coughing. A wave of nausea overcame him, causing him to vomit as he continued moaning in pain. All is just in war. Enemies, above all, deserve no honor, the knight hissed at Antonio before planting a solid kick to Antonio's exposed side. Antonio howled in agony, and Janice, Logan, and Erica reflexively rushed the knight. Despite the fact of his restricted hands, Janice was desperate to halt the beating of, his fr of their friend. All ca caution and thoughts of what he might incur fled in the surge of righteous fury. Janice and Erica were forcibly restrained as the other guards wrapped their arms tightly around the struggling pair. The knight grabbed Logan with both hands, gripping the collar of his woolen tunic. He lifted Logan upward with ease, such that only the tips of Logan's shoes brushed the planking. Do you want what he got? Are you that stupid? Perhaps I can share the wealth with your friend that your friend gained. The knight shouted, almost nose to nose, the iron of his helm pressing against Logan's bare flesh. Proud talk coming from a man wearing armor to a bound man without it, Logan growled defiantly. Folk wants them up here now, called an aggravated, impatient voice through the open trap door. Luck is with you today, cur, the burly knight snarled, the words sounding as if they came through clenched teeth. He jerked Logan down with a heavy thud, turned him about, and shoved him gruffly towards the steps leading upward. Twisting, the knight reached down to where Antonio was still clutching his stomach. With one arm, he wrenched him violently to his feet. An icy wave passed through Janus, witnessing the power and dexterity of the knight, whose thuggish rancor the captives had barely avoided. If it were not for the voice intervening from above, he and his companions would have soon joined Antonio on the flooring with heaving stomachs. Antonio swayed and vomited again as the knight unmercifully jostled him forward. The four prisoners were herded together towards a square of light beckoning to the open deck of the ship. To Janus, the light was a great boon after having endured the dark, cramped conditions of the hold. Upon his emergence onto the upper deck, Janus saw the ship was moving along at a brisk pace. The huge lateen sails were unfurled and filled generously with the winds. A multitude of rigging and tackle had been set to position in enormous yards so the great sails could most efficiently catch the gusting winds. The passage of the ship was rhythmic, rising and falling as it glided over the undulating waves. Sailors labored with the substantial array of ropes and rigging as orders for adjustments were called out. It was an impressive operation, the sheer scale of the yard arms amazed Janus. The four were led across the deck towards another staircase ascending to the level where, where, with full quarters at the stern. On the way, they passed a number of hurrocks being attended by several crewmen. The latter were busy adjusting saddles and harnessing. Folk was on the platform just above the one with his living quarters, reached by a few steps located to either side of the stern cabin. Seeing the approach of the prisoners, he dismissed a couple of warriors he had been in conference with. You will be in Avalos soon enough, Folk proclaimed to the prisoners, stepping down to the level where the prisoners were gathered. Janus kept his vice and serene and his mind focused. During every moment he was with the Avanorans, he knew something could be gleaned of their captors' attitudes and values, if he stayed alert. Folk walked up to Erica and ran, slowly ran his finger just underneath her chin. The left corner of his lip turned up in a smirk, and Janice did not fail to catch the desire sparkling in the man's eyes. Anger whipped through him at the recognition, though he kept his composure. Do not fear Avalos or Avanor. Under the guidance of the Unifier, it is free from strife among barons and dukes. You will find much to your liking there. Perhaps there will be a man of nobility you might find interest in you within the great city, Folk stated, keeping his eyes upon Erica. Letting the insinuation sink in, he smiled at the other three. Perhaps there will be a noble woman attracted to one of you. Gaining service in one of Avalos's great households would be a boon to you if you are of no use to the Unifier. 
You will see that Avalos has every pleasure known to the world, all manner of food, drinks, spices, and herbs, acquired by trade with the realms of the world. There are those who do not enjoy the benefits of the Unifier's vision and generosity to the fullest, but their influence fades. Generosity? Like my friend getting beaten to the floor by an armored man? Logan interjected, glancing toward Antonio, who was hunched over and cradling his stomach and still looked queasy. Folk stared at Antonio for a moment before looking back to Logan and the others. I apologize for the precautions we must take. Many of my men must remain garbed for war. We do not know you, and the times are uncertain, and we must pre remain prepared for anything, Folk stated in a cool tone. We all understand, Erica said with a sweet smile before Logan could reply. Janice could see she wanted to placate the Avanoran ship commander. So what do you hold in esteem in Avalos? As a foreigner, I know little of your ways, Janice queried. While he wanted to help Erica distract the Avanoran from Logan, he was curious about the sort of standards the more dedicated followers of the Unifier openly adhered to. Order, security, freedom, Folk replied with a charming smile, replacing the icier one of moments before. The Unifier is bringing the entire world together in trade and mutual respect. The wars being fought now are the wars to end all wars. Once Salavave is under the Unifier's guidance, you will see a golden age come into being. Janus kept his face calm as he took careful note of the Avanoran's words and tone. The reverence and folk for the Unifier, for, the reverence and folk for the Unifier bordered on more than a mere respect for authority. It was as if the Unifier was something more than any king or human leader. Folk was clearly a powerful man, but there's no mistaking the awe in his voice as he spoke of the Unifier. Truly, we are freeing the world, Folk then added. So how far away is your lovely city of Avalos, Logan questioned Folk, with obvious sarcasm in his tone. Janice grimaced as Folk's mouth grew taut. And if you value freedom so much, and are forcing this freedom on other lands, then how is it we were treated to a feast in the five realms and allowed to go about unfettered? And we are bound up, intimidated, and given nothing in our first interactions with people from your blessed realm. We are not far from the port in Thessalus from which our ships departed, but you will be sent west upon Herox, Folk said, turning to indicate the group of winged steeds below on the deck. As to your treatment, as I said before, there are precautions in times of war. Once you are in Avador, you will experience freedom. I am so sure you are right, Logan retorted laconically. Janice feared that Logan was treading close to an invisible line, or that he had crossed it. But Folk did not show any signs of anger. He merely swept his gaze beyond the prisoners toward the steeds and nodded as if, as if in response to someone. Janice followed the Avanoran's gaze and saw a pair of Trogan warriors standing by the steeds. The Trogans were looking back towards Folk with attentive expressions on their dog-like faces. Get them onto their mounts, Folk commanded the trio of guards escorting the prisoners. Janice felt his arm grab firmly as group was taken to the lower deck and led toward the Herox. With their wrists bound, the mounting of the steeds was an awkward process. The hulking knight and the other two guards pushed and shoved the prisoners into place on the saddles. The Trogans trudged over and inspected the captives as the human guards stepped back. The tall beings tied le extra leather straps around the hips and legs of the prisoners, securing them further to the saddles. Janice found himself marveling at the Trogan working on his own saddle. Engrossed as it was in its task, it did not take notice of his attention. He studied the canine-like visage, with its high forehead framed by a mass of dark hair, the latter much like a mane in how it framed the Trogan's face. He noted the stout, sharp fingernails at the end of its strong hands, like claws of a moderate size. He flinched, seeing the creature's golden eyes peering up into his. It had taken notice of Janice's close scrutiny, and for the slightest moment the lips of the creature pulled back in an expression that was either a scowl or a snarl, revealing its long, sharp fangs. Though the Trokin was probably just irritated at the obvious gawking of the prisoner, the raw, feral look unsettled Janice nonetheless. Folk stepped into view in front of the sky steeds. He addressed the group in a formal tone. You will now go to Avalos, where you will see the ways of the Unifier. You will realize the wisdom and guidance that the Unifier is bringing to the world. Looking to the Trogans, who had now mounted their own steeds, he made a curt hand gesture. The Trogans nodded and took up the reins of the Herox. After a couple of shouted commands from the Trogans, the winged beasts lurched into motion, bounding down the open deck and leaping upward. Their powerful wings beat up and down as they clung to the air and began ascending. The steeds of the prisoners followed suit, responding to the vocal commands. Once airborne, the group gained altitude rapidly on a sharp incline. Looking downward, Janus watched as the huge warship became smaller and smaller, just one of several in the fleet streaming back towards the port city of Thessalus. He felt a great anxiousness at the fact that his hands were tied together in front of him. 
Even though the Trogans had taken additional precautions to tie him into the saddle, his nerves remained frayed. Even though he knew if he fell from it, the height they were flying at, the result would be the same whether or not his wrists were tied. Nevertheless, he would have felt much better were he not constricted. The skies above were thickly clouded, and a darker tinge to the vaporous formations evidenced a gathering storm. Passing through a swath of low-hanging clouds, he felt cool moisture dampening his face. The Trogans leveled out their flight pattern about a hundred feet above the cloud, low cloud layer. Though resigned to the situation, Janus felt frustration welling up inside. Thrust into a vast unknown, Janus and the others could not begin to get their bearings with chaotic events overtaking them at every turn. Turning his head, he looked over to Erica. To his surprise, she was staring back at him. Catching his eyes, she gave him a smile. Her demeanor bolstered his sagging morale, and he gave her a smile in return. Logan, flying a little forward of Erica on her other side, nodded to Janice. The stoic gesture displayed a considerable degree of determination. Among the faults Janice found in Logan, resolve was not one of them. Antonio, to Janice's left, was not doing so well. His eyes were closed and foamy spittle covered his lips. He shuddered and a forlorn gaze rested in his eyes as he opened them. It was apparent the hard strikes to his gut, compounded with the lofty altitude, had made him sick, and he showed no signs of shaking it. If anything, he was looking worse. Janus turned away, unable to think of anything he could say to help Antonio out. The flight was going to be absolutely torturous for the poor young man. Janus felt sorrow and empathy at Antonio's plight, cursing the desolate specter of helplessness present in its cold, dark glory. And that wraps up uh, the reading, and that's from Spirit of Fire, book three of the Epic Fantasy Fires and Eden series. So thank you for joining me today. It's great to be at the Red-Headed Bookworm. Thank you, Heather, for having me. And look forward to hopefully returning again. Take care.